Okay, let's talk a little bit about the role of bacteria in primary production and in the ocean in general. And bacteria really, in the sense that we're going to talk about them today versus how we're going to talk about them when we get to chapter 14 and talk about food webs, really are nature's little recyclers. And as nature's little recyclers, they break down organic matter, just like the pile of grass in your backyard or a banana or something that you left out or food that you left out begins to decompose. Those are bacteria breaking that down. And as they break down that organic matter, they're really just chopping up the molecules in a metabolic sense and creating new sources of nutrients, nitrates, phosphates, other kinds of nutrients that are then available for phytoplankton growth. It's those heterotrophic bacteria that really have allowed us to live, in a sense, without being under miles of dinosaur poop. Bacteria broke it all down and turned it back into inorganic nutrients that can then be used by plants. Bacteria are wonderful recyclers, and we should appreciate the job that they do. So heterotrophic bacteria in the ocean, when bits and pieces of sloppy feeding or bits and pieces of zooplankton poop, a process called egestion, as those bits and pieces come raining down, bacteria rapidly colonize them. They begin to break them down. As they do break those down, they use oxygen. They're heterotrophic. They're not the symbiotic. They're not the photosynthetic bacteria. So they're breaking down that organic matter, using oxygen, releasing CO2. So it's a respiratory process. But in that process, they're releasing also nitrate and phosphate, something that we call remineralization. They are remineralizing the water column. The upshot of that is that as organic matter is produced and sinks through the ocean, those nutrients are being replenished. So think about it this way. In the upper ocean, as long as there's photosynthesis going on, they're going to be using up those nutrients. But when the photosynthesis stops, even maybe at nighttime or in the winter seasons when light intensity is very low, bacteria can replenish those nutrients by breaking down organic matter. So this process of remineralization is happening all the time in the water column and it's happening everywhere that we find organic matter in the water column. But the only difference is where phytoplankton are growing, the nitrates and phosphates and those nutrients are being removed. Once those processes slow down, then remineralization resupplies those nutrients. At the same time, if we have water that's been in the dark, that has not been stripped of its nutrients by phytoplankton, if you have some physical process that pulls that nutrient-rich water because it's been in the dark, so the nutrients are still there, if that water comes back up towards the surface, then that's another way that you can resupply nutrients to the, water, to the surface ocean and to the phytoplankton. And again, it's because of this process of remineralization, nature's little recyclers, that we can get nitrates and phosphates and other nutrients produced and get them back into the water so that phytoplankton can grow and reproduce again. This cycle by which phytoplankton use nutrients, use nitrates and phosphates, or any other substance, including carbon, or, and by which heterotrophic bacteria then break down the products of photosynthesis, or the byproducts of zooplankton feeding, are called biogeochemical cycles, or global biogeochemical processes. So heterotrophic bacteria are a really important process of nature's cycles, and that's why they're called nature's little recyclers. Here is a depiction of one cycle. This is the nitrogen cycle. And yeah, it's complicated. And most things, unfortunately, are, but fortunately, it keeps scientists employed as well. And I'm not going to go into all the details of the nitrogen cycle. Although, if you do own a, a saltwater aquarium of some kind, this graph will really help you better understand some of the things that you need to set up. Because in a saltwater aquarium, particularly in a coral reef tank, you need to establish a very good nitrogen cycle. Otherwise, ammonia. If 
you're missing any of these steps in your aquarium. And this is probably true for freshwater tanks as well. They're just a little more tolerant. Ammonia will increase, and ammonia is deadly to many organisms, high concentrations of ammonia. So not only is the nitrogen cycle important in the ocean, but it'll help you understand something about your home aquarium as well. And again, I'm not going to go through all the details. This graph is here. This figure is here to be illustrative of a particular um, cycle and to give you some sense of all the different steps that are important to understand for understanding, again, the growth of phytoplankton and the processes that resupply those biologically important nutrients to phytoplankton. So here we have the ocean nitrogen cycle. The other aspect that we want to keep in mind is that all this carbon that's being produced by phytoplankton is also potentially released back to the atmosphere. And it's released back to the atmosphere as organisms graze upon the phytoplankton, they respire, and just like when you and I respire, we release CO2. And this is going to be important to keep in mind when we talk about iron fertilization. It's great if we can stimulate the activity of phytoplankton and make them grow and make them pull CO2 out of the atmosphere. But unless that carbon makes its way down into the seafloor, where it's fixed permanently and buried for hundreds of thousands of years, it really doesn't do us any good. And this is called the biological pump for that reason, this process by which photosynthetically fixed carbon makes its way down to the seafloor where it's deposited permanently, at least until these, the seafloor here does what? Well, until the seafloor is eventually subducted in a subduction zone. But this is how we get rid of carbon in the atmosphere, and it really is the main mechanism of removal of carbon in the atmosphere even more so than land because land doesn't have the advantage of burying carbon extremely deep although of course with coal and those kinds of natural processes we, we do have burial of carbon as well but most carbon's buried in the ocean of course because the ocean is also makes up 70 percent of our planet so again this is one of those figures that if you spend some time looking at it will help you develop an understanding of why biological productivity, why primary productivity is important and how we may or may not consider the role of the ocean for removing CO2 in this sort of iron fertilization geoengineering scheme or how it may be used for that. So all these things have to be taken into consideration when we talk about getting carbon out of the atmosphere and down to the bottom of the ocean. And we'll talk a little bit more about these when we talk about food webs.